welcome to another episode of the Physical Education Podcast. Today I have returning guest Keith Littlewood, who is a pain, performance, biomechanics, health, digestion, hormonal expert, very knowledgeable man. We had him on before talking about, um, I suppose, nutrition and digestion in a broader sense. But today I brought him on to talk about sugar, which is a very controversial topic. And he's one of the only people that I hear talking about sugar in a more balanced and nuanced way. So if you're the kind of person who thinks that sugar is evil, that it's terrible, that it's poisonous, toxic, causes cancer, and is at the root of all of modern man's problems, then you should listen to this. Um, if you don't believe that, then listen to it anyway, because it's a, it's a good discussion. The issue of sugar seems unrelated to pain. I understand that and um, it's very important for the issue of stress and the issue of stress is very important for the issue of chronic pain so there is a, a connection there that I'll expand on at the end and hopefully as you begin to, to listen and, and see what Keith has to say the viewpoints he can share you can see how this ties into a broader perspective of health and perhaps to your own pain so Lots of very detailed information. We went with some common myths and misconceptions. I had a list, but I barely had to refer to it. Keith kind of went off and gave us some really context specific and, and some really deep background information to, for you to understand what sugar, it, uh, what sugar is, uh, what role it plays and why it's maybe not as bad as, as you've been told. Uh, so hopefully you can actually um, apply that information uh, to your own health and make some improvements. So I hope you enjoy the show and I'll see you at the end. Welcome back, Keith. Thanks for coming on today. <laughs> today we're going to talk about sugar. I'm going to uh, hopefully get your expertise on what sugar is, what it isn't, and hopefully debunk some common myths and misconceptions. So to get us started, could you give us a rough overview of what sugar even is for the layperson? Um, yeah. Sure. So the, I think the loose banded term that we use sugar for is uh, carbohydrate, really. It's, it's, uh, if we could kind of talk about the basic fuel of the body, it's glucose. Uh, fructose is also metabolized by the, by the body fairly well as well. But it's our primary fuel source. Uh, and I, I think that there's probably too much scaremongering about what sugar is and what sugar isn't. Um, sure, let, let's talk about perhaps is there a problem when people consume just refined sugar all the time? Yes. Hmm. Is there a problem when people just consume pure oxygen all the time? Yes. <laughs> there, are, there are problems at, 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 at varying uh, levels. But I think um, what we should define sugar as is, uh, and if we look at the basic kind of construct of sugar is glucose, and glucose is the primary fuel source of, of, of the body, and it's the most efficient fuel source. But, uh, you know, uh, glucose is used, is used by the brain. I think it used 75% of the brain's uh, glucose stores throughout the body. So when, when we go into kind of low blood sugar states, we, we tend to um, enable certain mechanisms to uh, fill the void of not having enough glucose available. So I, I, I view sugar as actually an essential nutrient. And we've evolved, well, certainly the that the, the multifunctioning cell has, has evolved over uh, billions of years, hmm. which is, has been enabled by the use of thyroid hormone. And that's, that's a pretty advanced mechanism over the, the cell that didn't use, uh, utilize oxygen. So when we were producing, uh, using you know, um, cells that uh, weren't able to, to function without the use of oxygen, they were very inefficient and it produces a lot of lactic acid. And, it, uh, and we know that the lactic acid producing cell doesn't function as well as the, 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 the cell that uses oxygen and carbohydrate as a fuel. So wh when we lose the ability to, to use carbohydrate, we see a, a number of problems. So uh, to answer the question, I see, I see sugar um, not always in its kind of totally re refined format, bear in mind that as I said, if we just eat pure refined sugar, it's lacking in certain nutrients. Mm. But people don't tend to go and eat bagfuls of sugar. They tend to have, you know, perhaps uh, um, food that has a lot of processed sugar in it. But I, I think there are other compounds in it that are way more harmful than, say, what we define as sugar being the problem. And I think sugar gets a bad rap, much the same way that saturated fat got a bad rap. 
And I think where the bad rap that, that, that creates a lot of problems is an ex excess of something. But to say that sugar is this, this devil, or I remember studying with an organization once and it used, uh, used the, um, the analogy that they're four white devils and it was dairy, salt, white bread and sugar. <laughs> just, enough, just enough of those uh, uh, good and bad analogies to make you feel guilty about eating something. But I think sugar is actually on the whole is quite protective. Yeah. Um, I, I think we should aim to look at getting most of our, our sugar sources from plenty of fruit, easily digestible fruit, juices, uh, which raises a lot of eyebrows with some people, but I don't mm. think juices are problematic. And cer certainly honeys and maple syrup. And then if, if, if somebody's out and they're not able to get that kind of food, then certainly having a sugary snack can actually fill the void. And when you start to look into the biology of um, what creates good cell function, what doesn't, there are certainly plenty of foods that we can vilify that are, are problematic. Hmm. And it just you said before that you would view um, sugar as an essential nutrient, but it, I think it, it would be worth saying that that's not necessarily a particularly controversial view if you were to look at, you know, physiology. So that's not even that that's your fringe belief. It's when you yeah. get down to it, carbohydrate is an essential nutrient. Um, it's yeah, yeah. It, it, it is, and that's the kind of a basic biological mechanism, right, is, is the utilization of carbohydrate. I think where people get their knickers in a twist sometimes is because, and you see the, um, the demonization of food. Uh, I think Mark Hyman from the Functional Medicine Institute does a great yeah. job of, of supporting the narrative and the meme that um, sugars is addictive as cocaine and it causes cancer. But yet the research behind that is certainly not validated. Sure. Uh, and everybody goes around the, um, goes kind of with these ideas that hey, sugar does cause cancer, and sugar is really addictive as cocaine. It's like, really, is sugar that really addictive? Um, the research that I've read, it doesn't support that. Hmm. But I would also start, start to entertain notions of someone's physiology. If somebody's reaching out for sugary snacks all the time, and they become, you know, they start crashing because of those sugary snacks. They're probably starting to reach for those sugary snacks because they can't balance their blood sugar levels out effectively. Hmm. Now, if they start throughout the day eating lots of kind of junk type food, that not only has a lot of sugar in it, it has a lot of vegetable oils, it has a lot of uh, preservatives, and it's generally not food that has a good amount of nutrients in. Then this can cause problems. Hmm. But we, again, we're still we're still vilifying the concept of sugar, and sugar in the diet isn't actually problematic. It is when it reaches um, proportions just like any compound, mm. but I think, you know, being able to, to keep your ability to utilize sugar as an optimal fuel source within your aerobic metabolism is one of the most beneficial things that we have for offsetting diseases like cancer. So, you know, and, and also if we look at the other metabolic diseases that are springing up, we have diabetes, we have cancer, we have Alzheimer's, all of these to a degree are, are symptoms of, of uh, faulty carbohydrate metabolism. When you can't utilize carbohydrates and sugar effectively, we tend to switch to the more problematic um, uh, mechanisms for, for breaking down fuels. And ultimately, uh, one of the well-known mechanisms is the glucose fatty acid cycle, or what's sometimes known as the Randall cycle. And that's where we lose the ability to, to utilize carbohydrates and we switch to burning fatty acids as a fuel. Now, this is problematic for many people because when you don't uh, actively use carbohydrates with, with oxygen, you don't produce as much carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide is, is essential in the body for allowing you to use oxygen effectively. Some of the other problems that occur is if we go to advanced stages of kind of metabolic dysfunction, we start producing a, a lot more issues from glycolysis and lactic acid production as well. And so when we have lots of lactic acid in the system, sure, it can be shuttled off to the liver to be broken down as, as, a, as a fuel source again, but it's, it's generally nine times less efficient than, than having carbohydrate available to, to be used within the normal functioning kind of cell physiology. So this, this, this mechanism that we have, and when we see people not being able to utilize carbohydrate, perhaps we lose insulin sensitivity as well. It's not the fault of sugar, it's the, it's the state of the metabolism that's got us there. Hmm. And this can come from a number of things. Vegetable fats, and especially heated fried vegetable fats, have been implicated in, in destroying cellular physiology. So we go to this 
uh, less efficient state of, of, of physiology. Uh, there are certainly many environmental pollutants that can do that. So I think to blame sugar and say that sugar causes this is, is certainly unfounded. Uh, and again, but it does come down to the balance of the diet. There are certainly areas where in someone's diet where they can choose to, to eat foods that don't support cellular physiology. But at the same time, it can get wrapped up because they're going for the sugary snacks where there are lots of other compounds within that food that can create damage that why sugar can get the blame sometimes. Hmm. Okay. Um, you mentioned that, um, what was it? Yeah, sugar causing, this belief that sugar causes all of these things. A way that I, I tend to think about it, it's when people say, uh, my knees hurt when I squat, but the problem isn't that you're squatting, it's that maybe it's your mechanics, maybe it's uh, your knees are weak, but the person will say, well, squats are bad for your knees. It's yeah. sort of, um, in, in this case, sugar is often the scapegoat, uh, where there are plenty of reasons why that might be happening, but it, uh, it gets blamed on sugar for whatever reason. It's like, uh, I'll hear people say that um, I'm, I'm eating too much sugar, but really what they mean is I'm eating too many donuts, which is a, a very different thing. You know, yes. it's one ingredient within you know, a series of ingredients. And at the moment, our mind is really fixated on that. But maybe 20 years ago, someone would have said, oh yeah, there's too much uh, hydrogenated fat in yeah. that. And they, they would have been right, but now yes. they're, they're focused on, uh, on the sugar. Yeah. Um, you mentioned a lot of these things kind of all together, um, but maybe we could go through them one by one just with a quick, uh, I suppose, debunking. Uh, a common thing we hear is sugar causes inflammation yeah where i don't even know where people get that from but i hear it everywhere yeah Do you have a simple explanation for why they might believe that or why they're wrong i don't know actually and i talk about one of the, the organizations i studied with and i studied with the czech institute a number of years ago and some of this stuff was really really good from the mechanic perspective yeah. and some of the other stuff i've kind of moved away from but one of the things they used to say was that even one teaspoon of sugar causes inflammation and shuts down the immune system and i I, I kind of remember revisiting that a couple of years ago. Where's your research to support that? I've never seen anything hmm. remotely even suggesting that. And so I don't know where that actually came from. And so to say that, um, you know, sugar cause inflammation, let's take that back to someone's physiology. Look, if you're eating lots of refined sugar, like, you know, and it's, that's just in your diet and you don't have things like adequate protein or adequate, adequate fats, then you may have an issue there. And as I said about refined sugar often doesn't have the B vitamins and the magnesium sometimes. Mm. And so this can, if you, it's, it's, you know, going out and having some sugar throughout the day shouldn't be causing a problem. But if you have too much of anything, it can drive an inflammatory process. Mm. But also as well, so, so can your, look, we just talked about cellular physiology. If your cells don't function the way that they should do, then sugar would get back, blamed for that. Because what you're seeing, it's a bit like, let's say, I, think I posted on this about Facebook yesterday. It's before you start going to look at novel drugs, like uh, around, you know, for Alzheimer's, cancer, and perhaps depression, let's look at the kind of basic physiology that's around for, 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 for 13, 14 year olds in their textbooks is that the mitochondria should be able to break down carbohydrate effectively. And when you can't break down carbohydrate effectively, whatever the source of carbohydrate is, you will get more inflammation going on. And this inflammation drives the kind of uh, down function in, in, in how the cells function and creates more inflammation. The, 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 up, the, the net effect of that is increasing the amount of um, uh, free radicals that are produced. But bear in mind that some of the most potent free radicals that are produced are, the, are from the oxidation of fatty acids. And when we're stuck in a, in a stress physiology, we oxidize fatty acids far more than we do carbohydrates because we can't use, utilize carbohydrates. Our insulin sensitivities decrease and therefore we switch to burning fats as a fuel. And this creates a, a, a cascade of inflammation. Um, but so it's true sugar could cause an inflammatory process if it was in excess and the cells weren't able to um, regulate that process effectively. Now bear in mind, some people who have great functioning metabolism can deal with a lot more carbohydrates effectively. But people perhaps who have got into a state where they're obese or their hormones aren't work, don't work as well as they could do, their ability to, to use something that's relatively easy fuel to break down is lost. And that's where you see inflammation starting to increase. So again, 
we tend to be blaming the messenger. And it's a bit like saying, I'm not going to do squats because that hurts my knees. And it must be the squats. So, but actually, it's not the sugar. It's the system that's driving that. Uh, talking about overeating is, is another thing as well. Some people will overeat. Some people will overeat because they can't regulate their energy, because there are emotional factors behind that, uh, because they can't regulate their blood sugar levels. Their uh, feedback mechanisms of, of, of satiety are kind of uh, not as efficient as they should be. Just much like the, the, the feedback loop you get in the pituitary, we know that there are issues within the feedback mechanisms that get distorted because there's a communication issue. Hmm. So we go back to the issue about why someone might reach for sugary snacks. And reaching for a sugary snack isn't essentially a bad thing. You're propping up a mechanism because you're slipping into a stress state. Now, people might say, well, hang on, going to a low blood sugar state, is that a stress state? Well, by its definition, you produce stress hormones to compensate for the lack of blood sugar levels. So we only have so much glucose stored or glycogen stored in the liver. So people who want to go out and train early in the morning without, without um, eating will be typically being a stress. If your last meal was at 7 a.m. and you're not eating to 8 or 9 p.m., let's say you've kind of gone 14 hours without eating, where are you going to get your, 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 your energy from? Now, there'll be at some point, I can't remember the exact time it is, the way you'll preferentially shut down the amount of glucose you'll have to save it for the brain's function. So the brain will need the glucose, but we'll preferentially shut it down and start going into uh, you know, things like gluconeogenesis or the, 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 the starting of production of, of glucose and breaking down fats and if it's really stressful proteins, as we see in marathon runners, you, you know, despite not you know, trying to supplement with uh, drinks, they tend to have very low muscle mass because they, they constantly break it down in some cases. Mm. Um, so if we don't eat effectively, that can be the problem why, why um, we go into those states. So digressing from your original question about the inflammation, it's, it's really the system that's the problem. Mm. And sure, you can say, yeah, people who, who you know, you're eating lots of junk food and that's driving the problem. Uh, but at the end of the end of the day, it might be the system that's driving them to eat in a manner that doesn't support their optimal kind of physiology. So I think anything can create inflammation. Yeah. Estrogen, which is a very uh, deleterious compound to have in excess, can cause many different things that could be associated with an excess of, of different compounds. When the thyroid's not working effectively, we know one of the, the key um, symptoms of that is increased cholesterol production. Well, why is that? Well, sometimes because the tissue isn't functioning effectively, we produce more cholesterol because we need to, we, we need to improve the tissue that, that needs to be rebuilt. Also, other aspects of cholesterol as well is that we can't metabolize the cholesterol effectively and, and preferentially use it where it should be used. So we see cholesterol elevating, but it's a bit like saying cholesterol causes heart disease, right? Cholesterol doesn't cause heart disease. It's a symptom of either in ongoing inflammation or something as key as the thyroid gland not working effectively in the first place. And if the thyroid doesn't work effectively, you can expect to see inflammation because you have a hard time producing energy. You have a hard time using carbohydrate as a fuel. And this is sometimes the cascade where people shift from being able to use that sugar and carbohydrate uh, and that you switch to the fats. And that's where you get a lot more inflammation, inflammation being produced. So again, sugar, can, can produce inflammation, but it's usually the effect of the cell physiology that drives the excess of inflammation that we see. Okay, and one, one of the kind of, because uh, again, I'm no, I'm no expert in this, but Not more so I. talking, sorry? <laughs> Nor am I. Yeah, really well, so yeah, but... Uh, still scratching the surface. Yeah, uh, but what I mean to say is that you, you've got a, a greater depth of uh, study and, and understanding of this, but when I'm talking to, say, for example, friends, because I would... I would limit how much I, I talk about this to clients just based on scope of practice. But uh, one way I tend to think about it is that, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I find this a, a, a nice framework is that the body, it doesn't really have an off and on switch. If you give it a lot of resources, it will use a lot of resources. So if you have, say, two cars, identical cars, uh, and this is a bit mechanistic, but it's, I think it serves a good purpose. If they've got identical faults in terms of wheel alignment, uh, engine issues, if you run one for 100 miles and one for 1,000 miles, the one for 1,000 miles is going to show up more problems. But if you run the other one that length, those things will show up eventually. But it's only because it's running. And so you give 
the body sugar you give it fuel it's just going to run and if yeah. there's a problem well the problem's going to show up it's not the fault of the sugar as such it's yeah. just that was going to happen eventually but maybe you're managing it better for whatever reason so that seems to be a lot of the um the underlying mechanism for a lot of these things where we're blaming sugar for this for that for that uh, it's just the manifestation of an inefficiency or um, a nutrient deficiency but not yeah. sugar as such would that be roughly accurate in your view well i think what we have to take into account as well is that if somebody doesn't have the ability to use carbohydrate, whether effectively, whether you have given them sugar or not, a problem is going to show up at some point. Hmm. So again, whether you're giving them sugar or not, and you need to kind of look at this. I would think the problem is, is like you say, that when we are uh, consumed, if people are blaming sugar for epidemics like obesity and diabetes, they're, they're missing a key fact is that there's, <laughs> there's damage there already, like you suggest. And it is going to come out, but sugar gets the blame because people keep reaching for these snacks mm. that are going to help to balance them and make them feel that, feel good. But because mm. people are consuming these large amounts of sugar, or they're at least reaching for sugary snacks, it's the, the, the kind of uh, the, the you know the correlation uh, causation doesn't equal co correlation doesn't equal causation might, mm. might come into to play massively here because mm. you can see people with diabetes that don't consume that much sugar. Mm. Type like two diabetes, right? Yeah. Um, and and so we we have to start looking. I think the environmental stimulus is a huge part of why diabetes is more rampant. And you know, air pollution. We're we're seeing lots of issues related to heart disease, uh, respiratory diseases, and and you know, just because we're looking at respiratory diseases doesn't mean that we're not looking at uh, factors such as. Um, uh, we're kind of looking at reduced mechanisms because we're often not going away and looking at that. People then go, oh, now you've got diabetes further down the line. So we're still looking at reduced mechanisms. Hmm. I'm just going to turn my email off here. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, so I, I think to answer your question is that, yeah, sure, we, we, we will see these, these problems come out. I actually think the people who are consuming sugar actually uh, in the right amount are actually going to potentially decrease these mechanisms hmm. but bear in mind is that you can I find that giving people more carbohydrates and, and sugars in the diet actually makes them better um, when they're overcoming the, the issues that I tend to work with which is uh, digestion fatigue hormone related issues even sleep issues you know I certainly increase the amount of carbohydrates and and sugary snacks before bedtime like you know, some people who can't sleep is because it's a blood sugar regulation issue, mm. and giving them a spoon, big spoonful of honey at night time can do wonders for just allowing the body not to feel in a state of stress because it's waking up about two or three a.m. because their blood sugar levels have diminished so much. Yeah. Um, uh, does that kind of answer your question? Or? No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you mentioned a, a couple of things. This idea of of sugar cravings, and it's it's something I find interesting. Is that any other kind of cravings or things that we're naturally inclined to do we tend to trust in general so uh, fatigue perhaps hunger perhaps sadness we, we trust the wisdom of the nervous system or whatever it is that's happening but sugar automatically is an addiction it's something that's bad uh, and you mentioned the idea of sugar addiction having having zero uh, uh, no evidence that you could see so could you talk about why or how the the body has these self-regulating mechanisms sure. uh, where it would might be in its best interest to make you crave something like sugar or salt or yeah. whatever it is? Yeah, and I've actually had some conversations with therapists and uh, psychiatrists, or and they said, yeah, I've got clients that are addicted to sugar, and I've just seen them with it, and when they get off, it's much better for them. It's like. Well, okay, you're going to say that, but if you're not looking at biology, you're not understanding mm. about why you crave it. I'm sure there is a subset of people who have addictive tendencies, and we know that addiction is not necessarily related to a specific compound. Mm. It could be a need for escape. It could be a need for feeling a certain way. Yeah. We know that when people go into a large amount of people who go into hospital and who are given opioids, then come out and come off those opioids and painkillers with relative success um, without being addicted to them. So the, the question of addiction, I think, is, is, is something that uh, cannot be always related to the specific compound. Going back to the kind of the, the questioning about, you know, 
why we might crave this. And I talk about kind of metabolisms that are suppressed or, or faulty, and they don't like to function given the foods that they're given. So a lot of clients that I see will say, yeah, I crave sugar or coffee in the afternoon. Well, maybe you've got to a point where if you've had lunch at 12 or 1 o'clock and then 4 or 5 o'clock, you've been stuck in meetings and you're presenting and you're feeling that little bit of a slump. You know, usually about the three or four hour mark is when you're kind of, you know, if you had a, depending on the size of lunch that you had or the size of the breakfast, and bearing in mind our, our physiology could be in, in the state of play from the day before or weeks before if we've been following a certain cycle. So if your blood sugar drops below a certain point, we all experience the symptoms of hangeriness, right? Get irritable. So we were talking about um, sugar cravings being conflated with uh, addiction. And then you talked yeah. about, based on an individual's physiology, how about three, four hours in, say after a lunch, depending on the size of lunch. Uh, yeah. And we kind of got cut off there. But um, I think you're talking about glycogen stores and, and people's ability to actually uh, manage sugar yeah. cravings. Okay, so yeah, I mean, that three or four hour mark, sometimes going and reaching for a carbohydrate, you craving a sugary or snack or caffeine, is you're offering your body's way of trying to, to kind of fill a void. The, the, I think that the, the better functioning uh, physiology that you have, bear in mind, I think I was reading uh, a while back that our ability to store, uh, you know, energy in the liver in the form of glycogen has decreased substantially due to the kind of Western lifestyle that we have and you know not having to go long times without eating you know it's not like we have we need to go into kind of hibernatory mode or um you know just uh and store food up because there's a lack of food up uh, bodies never feel in that kind of threat so much anymore so now we will we'll be in a you know it might be a, a poor night's sleep you might have had a minimal amount of food you might have worked out in the day you might have stressful meetings it's that kind of midpoint in the afternoon when perhaps, you know, like three or four, if you've eaten around about 12 o'clock, is usually a classic sign that we're needing a little bit more energy uh, to support how we're functioning. I think normally, we, you know, um, you should be able to have three meals a day and not feel relatively stressed out by that to be able to go longer periods of time. Hmm. And certainly when I work with people, and I noticed it my, with myself, when I kind of sorted my, my physiology back, I could go for longer longer periods of time without necessarily feeling hungry, without feeling stressed, without feeling the world was coming crashing down around me. Um, but I think equally that some people just can function better from having five or six smaller meals a day. Um, I think the research shows well, only from a weight loss perspective that that's something you're interested in. That has no um, benefit for feeding your kind of metabolism for weight loss. That generally comes, I think, when your energy sorts itself out and your thyroid starts to work a bit better. That is something that will naturally take its uh, course when you go into calorie deficit. But when we're talking about kind of feeding your physiology for maintaining blood sugar levels, sometimes we have things like fatty liver. We have... Uh, low thyroid states, certainly functionally hypothyroid states and certainly subclinical hypothyroid states which don't get looked at um, that well and certainly that's the reason why I'm doing my master's degree is to challenge the, the thinking on how thyroid is looked at and when you get these people in these states or people who are looking at you know whether it's high adrenaline states, high, high cortisol states, they're going to be kind of using their energy in a very different way and women tend to be uh, more exposed to this than, than guys. I think the, the ratio is either one in five or, or five to one or, 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 or something like that that have issues with thyroid. And that's primarily because estrogen is an issue. Now, from a female perspective, during the cycle, one of the most common mechanisms that women experience is craving carbohydrates. And that's because they produce a large amount of estrogen in the follicular phase. Now, estrogen makes your blood sugar level drop quite substantially. And so this concept of irritability and PMS is actually wrapped up in low blood sugar states. Part of that as well is that if we look at the concept of progesterone, estrogen tends to kind of make our cellular physiology not function as well as it should and decrease blood sugar levels. Progesterone, which should be produced throughout the cycle, it's there at certain levels and generally produced more for females during the um, the uh, luteinizing phase and when we have the corpus luteum produced, it produces a phenomenal amount of progesterone. Um, progesterone actually helps to sensitize estrogen. 
no, estrogen, sorry, insulin. And it also promotes the, the, the working of the oxidative metabolism. So our classic kind of oxidative metabolism that uses our carbohydrates effectively can be enhanced by progesterone. So for women, when they're producing large amounts of estrogen, this classic blood sugar drop we can see. And that's why PMS, for example, is relatively easy to get rid of once you balance blood sugar levels out, make sure there's adequate progesterone available. So this mechanism kind of highlights that what we talk about in the low blood sugar states is that when you produce stress hormones because you're not eating effectively, you block progesterone. And when you block progesterone, you usually increase the amount of uh, glucocorticoids, particularly cortisol, to carry broken down sugar into the cell at the expense of progesterone. And that's problematic because it can play havoc with how we metabolize carbohydrates over a long period of time. So getting back to the original point is that you know, why does our body kind of make us crave carbohydrates? We can use the female menstrual cycle as a classic case of this. Here's a case of a, a, a hormone that uh, basically uh, dysregulates our blood sugar level, much in the same way there's not having enough energy being available to contribute to more hormones being produced that break down um, energy from the breaking down of stored uh, fatty acids into triglycerides, which in itself is a stressful response because it requires cortisol and most notably adrenaline to get you into that state sometimes. So um, that there are there are many reasons why we have this, and so necessarily reaching for that sugary snack isn't making us addicted to um, sugar per se. It's just our body saying, "Hey, you're in bl a low blood sugar state. I'm craving something sugar to." basically ameliorate that sensation. So I think a lot of people get confused by the concept of being addicted to sugar and either a faulty metabolism, a low energy state, or other hormones dictating that position that we're in, simply because you, you don't have the energy available. And whilst we talked about females of that, you know, I've worked with many females where you can make the distinction that a lot of females tend to under eat throughout the day. And that's what pushes them into that low progesterone, high estrogen, and often high cortisol state as well. Mm -hmm. And you can apply that with anyone, taking away the, the female cycle. You can take that stress response and apply it to anyone who's stressed, who's either over-exercising, who's under-eating, whose physiology isn't dictating the most optimal response. So there's, there's, there's a kind of broad scenario, potentially why sugar's not addictive. But if someone is addicted as such, then there's probably another mechanism related to addiction, and sugar just tends to be that compound perhaps related in that kind of dopamine reward state, but it's not necessarily sugar that's the, the, the culprit here. Hmm. Okay, and, and this is a, probably a nice segue into <clears throat> one of the points I wanted to discuss. You talk about the, the stress response and um, gluconeogenesis and that sort of thing. A lot of people will argue for the likes of ketosis and they'll say that you don't actually need sugar because your body can produce it from its own tissues should you need it and they use that as an argument for why you don't need sugar you know on top of all of these um these awful supposed facts about sugar so could you delve in a bit about the why relying on your body's own um production of glucose versus ingesting glucose why that process is stressful and maybe not something that we want to run on or have to rely on frequently? Sure. Yeah, yeah, and, and there is, again, getting back to some, some, some mechanisms of, of cellular phys physiology and, and biology is that carbohydrate utilization is the most efficient fuel for, for the body to use. Now, carbohydrate in, in its most basic form in sugars is easily metabolized. The problem is, is that when we do rely on, certainly, we know we can break down fats as a fuel, um, we know we can break down protein as a fuel, I'd probably argue that breaking down protein is, is, can be far more problematic than breaking down triglycerides. But it, there's a caveat to that. If you have lots of unsaturated fats stored as fatty acids, this can increase a lot of lipid peroxidation and create a lot of damage as well. Hmm. One of the net effects of using carbohydrate metabolism, as I suggested before, is that you actually produce more carbon dioxide. Now, having more carbon dioxide in the system is, is quite protective for a number of reasons. It allows us to utilize oxygen efficiently. Um, it can help to uh, restore bone uh, tissue. There are a number of, m many number of factors that make carbon dioxide an actual essential compound. And you don't get as much carbon dioxide produced when you metabolize fats as a fuel. 
Um, I think certainly as well as when you break down proteins, there's generally more ammonia production as well, which can be problematic as well. But I think if you know Chris Master John, yep. with his things, he made a valid point that even the Eskimos developed a gene where they, they couldn't get stuck in ketosis all the time because relying on ketosis can be very problematic for, for, some, for these and some other reasons, hmm. is that it is part of the stress physiology. When we don't have that uh, ability, when we don't have carbs available, obviously it makes sense from an evolutionary perspective that we have other mechanisms to rely on. Hmm. And so we would expect that when we go into kind of a slowdown in winter, we're probably not able to get out as much, I, I, in a kind of Arctic environment perhaps, Antarctic environment, you know, perhaps like an Eskimo type environment, that, there, there would, that we would have to have this so that we would be able to function. But it showed that he made the suggestion that being in ketosis, because it, it, has, it produces highly problematic uh, metabolites and compounds over long periods of time, it's not very useful for human physiology to be stuck in. So this is where kind of uh, being able to kind of use different fuels is, is, is essential. But however, being able to use uh, a, a fuel, fuels in that manner, which kind of mimic the stress response, is certainly not going to be uh, useful for long-term human health. Okay. And just uh, perhaps to clarify for, for some people who uh, maybe don't aren't familiar with the different types of fats, you mentioned that uh, we can uh, burn fat and, and that's fine, but it depends on the types of fat because of um, oxidation. What Could you expand on that and maybe clarify what kinds of fats are going to be safer and uh, that sort of thing? Well, I think fats, we also certainly need to make the, the distinction. Fats generally have more calories per weight. Hmm. So generally ingesting more fats can be problematic for weight gain because we have more calorie surplus around. So I think this makes, there's a lot of arguments out there and I'm digressing slightly about, you know, I think Gary Torbs is kind of keeps, uh, you know, throwing his hands up in the air about sugar causing obesity. But, you know, there's some very basic uh, uh, sums that add up that when we consume too many calories, this contrib contributes massively to obesity. With that in mind, it's like having too many saturated fats can be problematic. And the saturated fats tend to come from more of your kind of animal-based sources and fats. Coconut oil is a great source of saturated fat. Um, then we have our kind of uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, which tend to be more liquid at room temperature. Mm. Um, you know, the, the there was the the big kind of hoo-ha about saturated fats causing heart disease, which is pretty much debunked. Certainly when you have an excess of, of saturated fats, it can be problematic. But the unsaturated fatty acids, which we see in our, our corn oils, um, seed oils, nut oils, canola, this kind of stuff, they tend to be relatively unstable. If we look at the seed oil, flax oil, for example, it's, it's pretty unstable at, even at room temperature. And you get a lot of natu naturopaths and holistic therapists recommending the use of flax oil and say, yeah, you need to keep it in the fridge because it's relatively unstable. But then what do you think is happening when you put it into what should be a 37 degree body? There's going to be a certain amount of lipid peroxidation takes, takes place. And there's, there's been a quite a lot of research and, and, and that shows that when you consume a lot of fried food, because this is very unstable, it's got a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of compounds in there that have been oxidized that this can create a lot of havoc to how the cells function so polyunsaturated fatty acids in their heated state which produce all their, all of their compounds uh, tend to be more problematic for the cell um, oils like olive oil and, and say avocado oil which is your kind of monounsaturated fatty acids don't tend to be as problematic but even if you heat olive oil it does certainly tend to become relatively unstable when you heat uh, oils such as coconut oil and butter and ghee, they're relatively stable at higher temperatures and don't tend to oxidize as, as much. Uh, and certainly, um, if you're going to kind of want to cook foods and uh, fry them, I think using those saturated fats represent the safer option. We just have to be concerned about how many calories we consume within that context, though. But um, I think, uh, you know, it, it's we... We tend to look at when we lose weight about why losing weight is a beneficial thing, but sometimes when we're trying to lose weight, people tend to do it quickly. There's risk of damaging the cells, and you see people when they go on extreme diets because they're going not only in a calorie restricted state, but they're also using these unsaturated fatty acids converted to, you know, triglycerides and ultimately broken down to 
to glucose at the end, end result and, and convert it into energy is that these are the um, these are these are the potential things that can cause problems. And it's well known, as I said, that the unsaturated fatty acids are probably the most unstable and the most problematic of the fats around. And I think keeping fats generally reasonably low uh, within the diet, especially if they're unsaturated fatty, is key. Uh, I think people who kind of, you know, if they're looking for kind of calorie restriction for weight loss, I think, you know, you need to keep fats as low as possible. Uh, but generally, if, if you're looking at uh, fat loss, for example, you're going to have to look, look at the calories overall and, and keeping your physiology functioning as well as it could do. But certainly going for more saturated fats and unsaturated, unsaturated fatty acids makes the most sense. Hmm. Okay, and, and that's sort of, a, again, a nice segue into the topic of ketosis that we, we've touched on. But the big thing now is, is, if not ketogenic diets, very high fat diets and a lot of people talking about the likes of uh, epilepsy, Parkinson's, all that sort of thing being reversed or being alleviated or uh, improved with ketogenic or high fat diets. Where, where is that coming from? Is that just a short term benefit or is it just a superficial benefit and the underlying physiology is out of whack? How might you explain that to someone who's read on collective evolution about the benefits of you know ketosis how do you approach sure. that well ketone bodies have been found to be to be beneficial in some of those cases um, sometimes if you're talking about issues like epilepsy if it, that there's quite there's a possibility that when you're kind of taking a lot of sugar that can't be utilized effectively out of the diet and you're taking some of the compounds away that might cause problems this might explain the benefits in that I would say issues like epilepsy are a, 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 an energy state issue um, I, I can't explain fully why just the ketosis is beneficial, um, and that might be uh, a, a, uh, another blog post that we could talk about at some point. But certainly I've seen other issues that, that kind of clear up epilepsy, like the use of progesterone, which would enhance sugar production, uh, sugar utilization as well, mm. within the use of, of clearing up epileptic fits. And if we think about epilepsy as a kind of a brain energy issue and how we utilize our energy, this might explain the overall mechanism. And I think we need to be careful about what we're looking at with the, the long-term effects of ketosis on these states. We've seen a lot of short-term studies that might see a reduction in kind of glycated end products and some of the damaged products by not being able to utilize carbohydrate effectively. But we're not necessarily seeing the long-term states of what's happening when potentially, you know, it's a bit like people who go on a, like a, a high-fat diet and you're switching from eating a lot of carbohydrates. Now, a lot of people who might benefit in that short-term state are people whose physiology just isn't functioning as well as it could do. So you're creating a change and perhaps removing some of those compounds in the short term that might be problematic because you can't use insulin corrective, uh, in a correct manner, you can't use your carbohydrates in a correct manner. But what are the long-term effects of that? Because are they going to create long-term energy issues and you know this is why people who go on like a high fat diet initially notice some really good changes they end up depleting a lot of the glycogen in the uh, in the liver from carbohydrate and then they start using fat uh, uh, to a degree a little bit more effectively as a fuel but the long-term effects of that you know people don't often talk about and I wrote a blog a few years ago about the kind of the zone of dogma creation is that we'll see a change whether you go Let's say you go from high meat eating diet to a, a low meat eating, even perhaps even a vegetarian type diet. You might see some very good beneficial changes with that within the first three six months. But what's the, the long term effect two or three years down the line? That's what we need to be concerned of when we're looking at mechanisms like that. You know, it also kind of begs the point. People talk about the the uh, positive changes that you see on MRI to imaging related to calorific restriction. Uh, and people are saying that there's these wonderful changes to Parkinson's like symptoms and neurodegeneration, perhaps Alzheimer's. But actually, and I think this has been supported in a, in a few studies, is that perhaps it's actually not the calorie restriction. Perhaps it's actually not been exposed to all the harmful compounds that are in foods these days, like heavy metals, uh, pesticides, fertilizers that might be causing the effect of that. And effectively you might be able to pass them out the system. But Again, that's going to be system specific. Some people will be able to metabolize them out of the system really well 
because they have a really good detoxification system working. Some people might not be able to. So we need to be careful about what we're saying about what is the exact mechanism that we're seeing working. Uh, and I don't know enough about ketone bodies to say, is this something that's going to be beneficial over a long period of time? But perhaps people who cycle in and out through different diets sometimes might find a benefit from that. I, I kind of tend to lean towards the, the more, uh, more around holism and keeping a cell functioning at its best possible state throughout lifetime. For me, that, 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 um, that means keeping in the energy constant th towards a cell. Now, people are going to cut back on certain things like calories and carbohydrates and say, I, I feel much better because of it. Well, that doesn't explain the mechanism as such because it might be your system that we've talked about a few times so far that just can't handle the optimal energy state. So taking stuff out and being in a slight state of starvation is why some people say, oh, my digestion's got better when I haven't eaten this, but really they've just gone a calorie-restricted diet and pulled loads of stuff out, um, and, it, it, and that might be beneficial in the short term, but because they start to restrict calories further and further, digestion can often get worse because you're slowing down the key mechanism of digestion, which is keeping enough energy going through the system to operate the smooth, smooth muscle tissue. So I think there are many mechanisms that work with that. And it's like, don't necessarily shoot the messenger. And it, you, you can't, can't deny that in, in short-term studies, ketosis has shown some beneficial issues. Hmm. But in, in long-term, we don't know. And also, we need to make a distinction as people talk about, you know, that uh, sugar feeds cancer. Well, sugar feeds every cell in the body. And when you restrict sugar against cancer, one thing it's going to do is rebound fairly aggressively and, and be able to break down uh, fats and proteins a lot more aggressively than it did in the first place. So this is a kind of another mechanism that we, we, that's kind of digressing slightly, but it's making a distinction about why sugar actually isn't the problem. Uh, and it's actually how we use the, the, the fuel in the first place. Hmm. Did that answer most of your questions without ranting? Yeah, no, in, in a lot of detail, that's great. And would it be fair to say that the whole sugar feeds cancer, but different cancers feed on different things, and it's not just sugar, uh, it's just uh, people are focusing on sugar again? Is it true that certain cancers will, will feed on fat, will feed on protein? Yeah, yeah. And, and it's yeah. shown that in, some, in cancers that there's altered kind of lipid pathways that, um, that cancers can aggressively uh, function. And I'm not an oncologist, and I don't know the ins and outs of, of, of all the cancers. Hmm. But so I do know a little bit about cancer physiology. And it's like when people use, make the distinction that sugar feeds on cancer, it's like so does every cell in the body. Hmm. Yeah. Every, 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 every cell will, will take sugar and utilize it as a fuel. Now, often that when, when our physiology dictates that we can't use that, some of the cells take that and still respond with glycolysis, but the mutated cell will, will use glycolysis as, as a fuel source and use carbohydrate, which creates a lot of lactic acid. But at the same point is that if that carbohydrate is not available, it will seek food sources because it's a cell trying to get energy. But often that energy production is so, uh, it's so suboptimal, it creates further ongoing cells. And that's why you see the acidity of cancer because it's producing a lot of lactic acid in most cases. Hmm. So, yeah, you can say that sugar feeds cancer, but it, again, it doesn't give you the answer because it, you can say, <coughs> you can, you're right there. Me, yeah. you can say that, that every cell feeds off carbohydrates, uh, and so uh, that you know, it's 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 a it's a no-brainer to, to to say something like it's it's almost making the distinction about sugar's addictive. It doesn't really actively describe the pathways and, and give you the, the full picture. Okay, so what you're saying is that you can't go on a low-carb diet and cure all cancers. I'm saying that some people might respond uh, differently to that, but hmm. if, if, if we're looking at how we can um, create change in, in a cell, it's not... Uh, let, let's make the distinction about diabetes, for example. We see a lot of sugar in the urine in diabetics, right? And that's because they can't utilize the sugar. Does that mean they don't need sugar in their diet? No, mm. because we still want to give cells that do have the opportunity to function really, really well the chance to overcome that. Is taking sugar out of the diet the, 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 going to be the, the same grace? No, it's not. Because if you're kind of stuck in the state where you're trying to opt, uh, you know, breaking down fats in your own body tissue as a fuel, which cachexia and wasting within cancer, is you don't have much sugar or the ability to use sugar anymore. So what you start doing is you see your, your end-state cancer patients are eating their own tissues away. 
Um, and so I think if we want to be really um, effective going forwards, and I, I made the distinction, it's not about understanding novel new drugs. It's not about understanding, uh, you know, the pharmaceuticals kind of uh, suit for that magic bullet that gets rid of cancers or Alzheimer's. It's actually enhancing how the cells function and understanding why they've got, got into that state in the first place. And you can apply that to a lot of kind of issues that you see, whether it's polycystic ovary syndrome or, uh, you know, high estrogen states of thyroid nodules or uterine fibroids or, you know, other, other kind of uh, problematic states. It's, it's the cells don't know how to function anymore. And, and that's typically why we have cancer is the respiratory defect, which was described by Otto Warburg, a well-known cancer physiologist. And his research often gets... His, I think it's his research that often gets misquoted as saying sugar feeds off cancer because he's, he, he, he's just saying there's a defect in the cell and this, the, the cancerous state will start to optimize the most easiest form of fuel to break down, which is sugar. Yeah. So I think it, there are a number of things that we can do with people who have the issues. I'm not saying, I'm not going to go on the record now and say, hey, you can cure cancer with this, but I'm saying... You're going to put someone in a much better state if you give them enough light, enough carbohydrate and other nutrients within the diet. You give them the chance to have better conversations with their environment because bearing in mind most of the time the, the conversation they're having is with a lot of compounds that are quite stressful and their physiology doesn't know how to overcome the stress that they're being exposed to. And you couple all of the other things in that that increase learned helplessness, uh, you suppress their biology to actually function. This is where these kind of dysfunctional states of biology occur. But if you can uh, allow the cell to have a uh, better state of function, and we know that infrared, infrared light does wonderful things for the cell and can enhance our ability to start using carbohydrate better. You know, sunlight can do that. Vitamin D can, can have, have a, a similar effect as well. Hmm. So it's not, it's not, again, shooting the messenger when it comes to saying, hey, you need to cut out all sugar to be healthier. That's not the issue. It's about understanding why your body can't metabolize sugar in the first place. But again, we, we know that eating too much or anything can be problematic. And for most people, I don't think sugar is the issue. It's, it's the state that they're in. Okay. The next big one that, that tends to be lumped in with that, and it's a, a sort of a similar idea, is that sugar feeds candida. And what you need to do is you need to starve candida so that it dies and the problem is solved. Can you talk us through that, roughly where the, the, the issues are with that thinking? Sure. Uh, my, uh, one of my mentors, Ray Peter, discussed this uh, reasonably well before. Uh, and I would kind of go down the line of saying, if you have a candidiasis or you have a bacterial overgrowth, it's a reflection of your immune system. It's not a reflection of how much sugar you eat. There are some caveats to that, and I'll kind of elaborate on that. Hmm. Bear in mind, candida is with us from birth. Um, it's one of those kind of uh, yeast bacteria that's around, and it will stay with the body for, for pretty much ever. Now, the level that you have it will be a reflection of how well your <coughs> physiology is functioning and ultimately how much you have to keep using your immune system to, to, to suppress. Um, your immune system should kind of suppress it along with your kind of normal working physiology. So if you have candida, if you, one of the things that you can do is if you take sugar out of the diet, it can respond quite aggressively by if you have an overgrowth and uh, it's there and it's uh, either there and it's, it's over amount or it's there in its natural state, what it can do is bury its roots into the intestines to reach your blood supply so that it can get some kind of carbohydrate from your blood. So net, you can't kill candida. And I was someone who 10 years ago was doing 200 stool tests a year and saying you've got bacterial overgrowth, here's loads of supplements, cut sugar out. And for me, it was the wrong approach. And I used to change some people's issues with parasites and stuff, but effectively, I'd see clients, you know, energy states and, and uh, that kind of depress after some time. So let's roll that back a bit as well. It's like the concept of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO, um, they found that that was present in uh, more than 50% of people with hypothyroidism, hypothyroidism, so slow. So the ability of your, uh, your kind of internal state or your, the bacteria in your bowel can often be a product of how quickly your food gets digested, assimilated, and then thrown out the back end. So if you have a slow transit time, 
you ultimately accumulate more bacteria. Now, candida can come as part of this. Um, other bacteria, even you know, issues like uh, your beneficial bacteria or your kind of so-called disease-causing or pathogenic bacteria can elevate with, with SIBO. Uh, and so we start to see more metabolites produced. Now, this is often where people tend to go, here you need to take loads of pro probiotics, cut out sugar and, and this. And it's true that sugar can ferment a bit more in these states, but at the same time, we would probably look to say, well, maybe there's a bit of an energy deficit, which may be coming from someone's diet, or it may be coming from something related to stress hormone production, or perhaps the suppression of hormones like thyroid hormone, which is related, again, to gut motility. So if we're going to say that you have a bacterial overgrowth, it's probably not sugar that's driving that. It's probably the, the ability of your energy and your, uh, your immune system to uh, uh, provide a sustained response to that overgrowth occurring because it should be kept in check most of the time. But, you know, there's studies that have shown that actually animals with uh, the least amount of bacteria actually function with a much better metabolic rate. That although the studies would tend to be conducted in very sterile environments, which is never going to happen in the real world, mm. but they showed that animals that without any gut bacteria at all actually had a very robust uh, metabolic rate and lived longer than animals with more bacteria. So that's something probably we're never, never going to be able to achieve, but it makes the, makes the sense of why people tend to have gut issues and bacterial issues when there are low energy states at play. So my kind of approach now is trying to understand why somebody has a low energy state, is it functionally suppressed by some compounds that are in their environment, their diet, or is it something they've inherited? You know, generally hypothyroid mothers tend to pass on that trait to, to their children and offspring. Uh, there might be, like I said, something in the environment that's driving that, but this can actually be the, the driving mechanism be behind the bacterial overgrowth. I don't think, cut, I think cutting sugar out is a bit like saying, you know, some of the mechanisms that we've talked about okay, you've got bacterial overgrowth, okay, well, it must be sugar that's driving that, but sugar's not the problem, it says that, why is that bacterial overgrowth occurring in the first place? Uh, and I think that makes a much more pertinent mechanism to go after about raising someone's biology. And I think naturally we should be able to suppress bacteria and get rid of parasites without the need of going on, you know, parasite and intestinal uh, bacteria killing diets, which probably go a good way to suppressing someone's metabolism if it's done over uh, an extensive period of time. Okay. okay. And this kind of made me think of, of something that we didn't really address, but that's probably really important, is this distinction between your simple carbohydrates and your more complex carbohydrates and your fibers. Uh, the, the general wisdom tends to be with digestive issues, you want the more complex carbohydrates and the fibers, but also you'll have people who do say that carbohydrates aren't that bad once they're complex because they don't spike the insulin. Can you flesh that out? Well, you need to, again, some of the studies where they've made those, they, they kind of haven't looked at the total uh, food that's in there. So you'll notice that if you look at some of the glycemic indexes, actually sugar and orange juice aren't as bad as some of the starchier compounds. So starches are more complex carbohydrates, often metabolize in the blood a lot quicker than your basic sugar compounds. Mm. And this is where I think, I can't remember the scientists, I don't know if it was Cellier or someone like that, they would put uh, feed rats like pure starchy carbohydrates and notice that it would be absorbed so quickly from the intestine, it wouldn't be there anymore. Whereas the other sugars actually may, may take a, they metabolize a little bit more slowly. But sometimes when animals have been fed diets with kind of corn oil mixed in with sugars and starches, it has very different effects to actually monitoring what they're doing on their own. So there are two points that you've made there. I think complex carbohydrates and starchy carbohydrates go a long way to increasing uh, intestinal inflammation. Uh, and there's this whole, uh, you know, movement which was created around the food pyramid and it's so eating something between what, six to 11 uh, portions of you know, starchy carbohydrates, cereals and breads and grains and pastas, there's a, there's a really good mechanism for increasing obesity, giving lots of people lots of starchy carbohydrates, which tend to destabilize your blood sugar levels a lot quicker than having, you know, some fruit and sugary snacks with some protein and some fats that are going to help to balance blood sugar levels out. 
when you eat sugars in isolation, obviously they metabolize very quickly um, and they can spike insulin. But then if you eat protein on its own, it can increase uh, an influx of uh, in insulin as well and elevate insulin on its own. So if you're eating food sources on their own, they, they do create uh, issues because generally we don't eat food like that. And if you're eating fruits, say in their whole form, they tend to contain potassium, which help to regulate blood sugar levels and insulin a lot more effectively anyway. So uh, I think starchy carbohydrates are probably more of the demon of the, the actual more simple sugars. Hmm. And that also leads on to the, what they can do to uh, digestive issues. Because they're harder to digest and they're more in a more fibrous state, they generally accumulate more bacteria. Uh, and they also increase the, the, the production of more intestinal serotonin which is probably the, a whole other uh, cast in itself on the role of serotonin. But intestinal serotonin actually creates a lot of inflammation in the bowel when you have it, an excess of it. Typically high levels of tryptophan from consuming lots of muscle meats or lots of vegetables of tryptophan. And often why people have dairy issues is because of tryptophan converting to intestinal serotonin. Uh, but that's not the issue. But if you're consuming lots of fibrous foods, that can increase serotonin as well. And you know the whole kind of things that we were doing like 20 years ago, where we were saying, oh, you, you've got problems with your bowel, go and have a big bowl of bran flakes or something like that. And sure as hell, the next day or a few hours later, your bowels will be so irritated, you'll be, you'll be pooping out due to the, uh, the increase of intestinal serotonin. Hmm. So it's something, something to look at if you're actually waking up early in the morning, which can be a blood sugar regulation, but it can also be from intestinal serotonin production. Uh, people talk about serotonin as a hormone, but it's actually like a, a, a an amine, and uh, it's a, it functions as a neurotransmitter. It probably has some other functions as well. But when we produce too much serotonin, it's worth noting that people talk about serotonin needing to be high before you go to sleep, and that's absolute crap because serotonin is a is a neurotransmitter of wakefulness, much like histamine and oxycretin. And when you come out of the waking state. We get the you know light hitting the eyes, which hits the the, the structures in the in the uh, in the hypothalamus uh, and the suprachiasmatic nucleus that kind of stimulate that waking state, but also it produces the neurotransmitters that bring us out of sleep, which are serotonin and histamine. So we need serotonin and histamine to be kept relatively low before we enter sleep. And sometimes if you're eating foods that are kind of quite fibrousy and hard to break down. That might be one of the reasons, along with the low blood sugar states, of why you're waking up, you know, between two and four in the morning. So I think keeping the complex carbohydrates down is a win-win situation for lowering inflammation in the bowel and for actually uh, uh, keeping your blood sugar levels uh, regulated more effectively. But it, it tends to be we've been so influenced about, you know, what a healthy diet is. Um, I've just seen a, a diet in my daughter's nursery they want us all to, to buy into and they're eating so many kind of starchy carbohydrates and brown pastas and brown rices. I mean, mm. Jesus, brown rice, I mean, you have to cook it for nearly 50 minutes just to even get it slightly palatable. You don't digest it. Or when you're eating foods that you don't digest in a low energy state in particular, and even people who aren't in a low energy state, you get so many inflammation, uh, so much inflammation that drives serotonin. And serotonin is one of those reasons why you poop stuff out your bowel very quickly is because there's a high amount of it. So I think to answer the question is that I, I tend to uh, move away from complex carbohydrates. Sure, I love to have a toasted cheese sandwich every now and then for the taste and the texture, but if I was to eat that all the time, I notice pretty quickly that you know I get blocked up, I get more histamine production, I get, you know, eyes get a bit puffy and stuff. Uh, and it's a bit like drinking beer. Sometimes you get that with kind of the compounds in beer as well, uh, which is a damn shame, I know, but... Um, it can explain some of the reasons why people have digestive issues coupled with blood sugar regulation issues as well. Yeah. Well, I think we've gone even more comprehensive than I'd hoped, so this is great. Before we begin to wrap up, are there any really common, common issues, misconceptions, myths that we've missed that you tend to have to address? Or, Well, I mean, I, you know, I, the programs that I have set up, I always get people coming back going, I can have sugar, I can have ice cream, hmm. I can have, you know, I can have these foods that I've been told are pretty much the devil in disguise. I said, yeah, because we're, we're trying to improve your biology. We're not just taking something away because you have a symptom. 
Hmm. And I think that's the, 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 the process of a credible program is rather than getting wrapped up in the symptoms, which even I think people get a lot, very, really guilty in, say, functional medicine approaches, is that we, we want to understand biology. And so if I'm working with someone who's really lacking in energy, and that I say, go, look, go and have a bowl of ice cream. And you'll, you'll notice that they've had some sugar, they've had some protein, they've had some fat, one, one decent hit there. And I just have people who are kind of close to tears, you know, sat talking to me. Again, I had a bowl of ice cream and I felt great. And this is where people might interpret, yeah, because that sugar's addictive and it acts like cocaine. It's, no, it's not. It's actually, it's actually giving you what you'll need because you're in a low blood sugar state. Do you want to eat ice cream every single meal? No, you don't. But as a, a stopgap if you're out or if you want to have it as a dessert because you've had a certain amount of nutrients, it's actually a really good, really good source of energy for you. Um, so I think exploring foods that kind of create better biologies is something that people need to get their head around. When we start to look at the states, we talked about fiber, but you know, diets high in beans and pulses. God, have you ever had a chili con carne and not had some of the worst wind ever? <laughs> some of these some of these foods like beans and pulses do not have that great compounds in and they're really hard to digest. It's it, even the kind of narrative about eating, you know, this kind of naturalistic fallacy of raw green vegetables and brown stuff. It's like a lot of people are, are so reduced in function, you're giving the compounds A that break down, you know, optimal energy. There's a lot of studies that show that diets high in brassica vegetables which take contain glycosinolates and iosynthates, I think it's the other one, tend to disrupt iosynthates, I think that's right, is uh, they tend to disrupt thyroid function. And brassica vegetables generally have compounds that, that, that uh, stop thyroid hormone being produced and binding. And this can be coupled with, with, with other states. But generally when you go to a diet like this, this isn't supporting your biology, it's shutting it down. So what do you need when you're in a low energy state? You need more energy. And if you, your energy system isn't, isn't functioning, sure, we can, we can take out some foods if we're eating them in excess and you can feel better. But having a steady state of energy by sometimes increasing the amount of sugar in the diet can be beneficial. Um, so I would ask people to get their heads around the fact that, that you know, make a distinction about when you're eating something. Because some people say, oh, I get hyper when I eat sugar. Do you get hyper or actually, actually are you being restored to your true energetic potential, right? Um, or are you getting hyper because you're eating sugar just in isolation on its own and you're having a pretty, uh, pretty big energetic, energetic effect? And if you're not eating it with other, other nutrients like fat and proteins, this is where you need to make distinctions on food. So I think... I think the, the thing is, it's just getting people's minds have been made up about foods because they see so much. Try the sugar-free detox in 30 days and notice what happens. Try it. But I tell you what, try it for six months and see how you feel. And generally, the, the neg there will be a lot of negative effects associated with that. So I think it's about balance. When it comes to New Year, don't do detoxes. Go and understand biology a little bit better. You don't need to detox. If you want to lose weight, you don't need to detox because if you do lose weight by doing a detox, you shut down your ability to, to actually detoxify properly. Hmm. You shut down your ability to regulate your metabolism. But it's constrained in the short-term effects that people get and see that they're beneficial. So eating, eating a certain amount of calories per day generally is good for most people. But when you kind of diet and then restrict sugars, you're actually losing your ability to, opt to, 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 to function as well as you could do. So I think it's worth just looking at, at some of the basic mechanisms. I think there's loads of blogs that I've written on my site where people can look at that. Um, so are there any other kind of myths and stuff? Um, yeah, I think you know, getting your head around the fact that eating a diet that's high in raw green nutrients and nuts and seeds actually isn't the best diet for a lot of people. And you know, we talk about the color plate. Yes, it has a lot of good nutrients, but they're, you know, let's take the concept of like yellow fleshy foods, for example, and vitamin A. The yellow fleshy foods, they, you know, they don't com contain vitamin A, they contain pre-vitamin A. And actually, if your liver's a bit sluggish, you have a really hard time breaking that down. So the whole concept of raw, green, and colorful foods can be great for some people in, in moderation. But if you're trying to eat a diet like that, just simply to reverse energy and digestion and mood states, you're probably going to find that long-term, that's going to be quite problematic for you. Hmm. So and for... If Sorry, go Any others that you think of that the people say that I can elaborate on? 
I have my list here and we've essentially gone through all of them. I'm I'm just thinking in terms of again bringing it back to the person listening to this who's uh, been indoctrinated by all of these ideas. Where might they begin? What might be something and we covered this in our last chat, maybe some things that they could measure or evaluate or self evaluate to get a sense of where they stand. Should they perhaps uh, go down this route of investigating the benefits of more carbohydrate? How might they yeah. do that? Well, I mean, there's a lot of people, you know, when you go into a low carb state or low energy state, typical, typically people get cold hands, cold feet, cold nose. And this is really an energy deficit. You've gone long enough without food where you don't have much energy available for the liver or it's prefer preferentially shutting off how much carbohydrate there is left for the brain to function. And this is why you get cold hands, cold feet and nose. And I don't know if you've ever experienced that before. And then that's generally relieved when you have a good feed, right? Mm. So there's lots of things that we can look at. So, you know, feeling sluggish, feeling cold, uh, feeling constipated. These are signs that your energy is not that great and can often be relieved with sustained eating. I, a, lot of, um, a lot of things I do with my clients is looking at temperature and pulse rate. So temperature, for example, <laughs> um, I'll explain why I use auxiliary temperature in the armpit. A lot of people use the concept of using... And I, I had a run-in with a doctor once who said that, well, you've got to take temperature from your teeth or your ear. It's like the brain uses 75% of the available glucose within the body. If you're seeing a cold temperature in the brain, it's going to be so far advanced that the rest of the body, then it's not a really reliable um, marker. Because it, if you think about um, somebody with a low energy state, or we think about constipation, there's a lack of energy of the motility of the digestive system. So you're probably going to see a lower temperature in the core than you are in the head first because the head's always going to be using the, the, <coughs> the amount of available glucose that there is. Hmm. And then it's going to be, it, the brain has to keep functioning. It's our control center, right? So this is the last place to, 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 to see any problems when it comes from temperature. Also, in the mouth, if you have any inflammation in the gums or the sinuses, which I sound like I have right now, um, is that you'll see an elevated temperature in, in, in the oral cavity anyway. So it, I, I think it's worth contrasting the two. But taking your temperature in your armpit for four or five minutes in the morning is a really good indicator of how much energy you have in a fasted state. Now, generally people should have a body temperature around about 37 degrees. When they wake up, it should be around about 36 and a half mark. After a good feed, it should go up to 37 degrees. And I think that 37 degree mark is a really good indicator of, of if the food that you've eaten has been either assimilated or it's a good food choice to generate a body temperature increase. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, now, some people, I've seen clients with body temperatures as low as 33 in the morning in their armpit, right. and either their food marginally increases them into the 34, but they're way away from where they should be. Or there's somebody who might come in at 35 and a half. And the food choice that they've eaten or they've skipped breakfast has actually brought their body temperature back down to like 35. Now, it's not a good indication of that the food that you've eaten has actually decreased your body temperature. It's a bit like a catabolic response of training, right? Mm -hmm. You can train and deplete stuff and your body temperature might be elevated through the short term for all the energy you've expended. But if you don't refuel, you're going to see these cold hands and cold feet. And that's an expression of how much energy you have. So I think testing your body temperature in the morning and after breakfast about 60 minutes is a really good indicator. Pulse can be used as well. I'm not going to get into the ins and outs of pulses because there are a variety of things that need to be considered with other hormones. But I think looking at body temperature as a whole, and if your body temperature is normal and you still feel crap, then you start need to looking at pulse rates as well because that can give an indication of if you're producing a lot of adrenaline, a lot of cortisol that's falsely inflating your temperatures which people can be in an advanced stress state when they, they're trying to um, produce energy because perhaps either the food they're eating isn't great or the, the, their thyroid has gone into a downturn and their, their mitochondria just can't effectively produce energy. So I think that's a really good tool. If you're not, if you're not increasing your body temperature, you need to start eat, asking yourself a question, why is the food that I'm eating not increasing my body temperature? <clears throat> because that, that's a really important question from creating energy. Okay, so I'm listening to this. I'm convinced 
I've bought into the message. Where can I find out more of your work? Where can I perhaps work with you? Give us all of your social media, all of your websites, that sort of thing. Well, that's good to know. If you go to my website, balancebodymind.com, it, uh, it's actually got all the new links to my online coaching program. And what I've tried to set up for that is I have a, a membership plan. So it's got something who wants in-depth coaching over three months or somebody that just wants access to coaching videos and lessons and they can walk themselves through the whole process. So I've now set that up and that's fully up and running. Um, but everything's available at Balance Body Mind. Um, Dot com and that's pretty much much it. You can find pretty much all of my stuff on there. And it's got some there's some interesting YouTube videos I've done on hormone function, and uh, I'll be putting a few more up at, at some time. But yeah, that, that's generally yeah. it. I'll uh, I'll include all the links to everything, your social media, and that sort of thing. Um, that was great. Any closing thoughts? Any L nuggets to leave people with? I, I think is that uh, you know. If, if you've been told that sugar's so bad for you, um, try, and, try and think of the reasons why people say that and why they're kind of supporting that story. <clears throat> if you take the, the basic biology of how we utilize carbohydrate, keeping your cells functioning with the ability to utilize carbohydrate is one of the, one of the best things that we can do to stave off disease. So don't shoot the messenger by kind of necessarily cutting sugar out. Uh, sure, if you're eating lots of refined foods, then that could be problematic. Uh, but you can, you can get a good marker of, of your health by understanding if you have good digestion, good sleep, good libido, good energy throughout the day, good mood, and generally a lack of pain. And they're generally the markers of whether I think a program is working for someone. So use those as markers to see whether, whether you're getting those kind of aspects of good health. Uh, and if you want to tweak them, then there's a lot of questions that you can look at. Um, but I, I realize a lot of people would probably have been uh, – left with the idea that sugar is toxic and, and it's as, as bad as cocaine and uh, <laughs> PCBs or phthalates, whatever it is in the environment, but it's actually not. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's a perfect note to end on. Thank you so much for your time, Keith, and your expertise. And maybe we'll do one on serotonin one of these days or whatever else comes up because that's, uh, I think, a whole new can of worms. So, yeah, there's so. some interesting stuff on serotonin and brain energy, so uh, it's, uh, it's uh, awesome. certainly worth, one worth visiting. But yeah, it's uh, my pleasure as always. Great to talk, buddy. Great. Well, I'll see you soon. I'll let you know when this is all ready to go. Have a good day. Take care. See yeah, you, you too. Bye. See you later, mate. Bye. 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 So that was my chat with Keith. Hopefully you enjoyed it. We went through so much stuff. I, I came in with a list. I had a list of all the really common common things that people bring up with regards to sugar and I didn't even really have to refer back to it too much. Keith kind of went off. It was great. He, he really fleshed out a lot of these ideas and hopefully if you went into it believing a lot of these common things, not only were you generally told that they might be wrong, but also you kind of have a sense of why of, uh, of the bigger picture of what's going on and how to better evaluate your own health. So I I kind of decided to talk about sugar because it's it's um it's a big issue actually it's something that people are really misinformed about and it's very hard to change people's minds because the it, it's everywhere the idea that sugar is is evil is is really everywhere and no one's really I don't see many people having a, this kind of discussion this kind of uh, level of detail that Keith can can provide on the topic I don't see people talking about this on that level and it does pertain to people in chronic pain because ultimately chronic pain issues come about uh, it's sort of a chicken egg situation they, they can it can go both ways but there's always an overarching stress stress issue and throw in a fear of sugar and a very low carbohydrate diet or the you know, your kale shakes all that kind of thing and you have even more reason for the body to be under stress so while it might not start that way you might have a chronic pain issue but then you're in this constantly low state where your metabolism is is um isn't functioning very well and your body's running on fumes essentially and it doesn't have efficient sources of energy and it's not running smoothly and it's not even able to begin to try to get out of that uh, state of <coughs> excuse me that state of pain so it, it might seem a bit uh, kind of random to talk about uh, sugar but it is 
very pertinent to the issue of chronic pain and the issue of health overall. So I wanted to have Keith on to talk about these things. So hopefully you enjoyed that talk. Hopefully you have a different perspective, a more accepting perspective, and maybe you want to have some ice cream tonight and not feel guilty about it. So if you want to work with Keith and you want some actual guidance with all of this stuff, because this is the other thing is that you can't really, I wouldn't recommend watching this and then saying, okay, let's go eat all the sugar. That's not a good idea. It's not something that you want to go from a low carbohydrate diet to suddenly eating everything in your sight. You want to do it methodically and strategically. Someone like Keith, will help you do that and he has an online service specifically for that for improving your own health and guiding you through that and i highly recommend it and there's very few people that i highly recommend he's one of them so check his stuff out check out the links in the show notes in the stuff below and we're hopefully going to do another talk on serotonin it's another substance that has um it's generally seen as positive actually but so this will be kind of reversed we're going to perhaps look at the negatives and where this idea that serotonin was so amazing where that came from and the whole industry that's built around that and that one might get a bit conspiratorial so that should be fun um if you're interested in hearing that let us know you know comment and you know we'll get the ball rolling because at, at the moment it's just an idea something i'd like to do but um it's maybe not a priority but if there's a lot of interest there we can kind of fast track it and get keith on board so check out all his stuff give us a like give us a follow give us a share give us a rating all that stuff and i'll see you in the next one